it's my pleasure to chair the first half of this morning's session. I'm Bob Tarjan. Our sp first speaker today is Martin Hellman. Uh, Martin grew up in the Bronx. He went to Bronx High School of Science, got his bachelor's from New York University, and then he went to Stanford for his master's and PhD. He was a believer in rationalism and he was cruising through his education when he ran into Gödel's last theorem, I am told, and confronted with the fact that there are limits to what one can prove, he had, shall we say, a crisis of faith. Uh, nevertheless, he overcame this and went on to win the Turing Award in 2015, along with Whitfield Diffie, who is here, and Ralph Merkel, for their work on asymmetric that is public key cryptography, digital signatures, and related ideas. So Marty, without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Bob, and thank you all for coming. Let me get myself set up here, start so I know where I am. Uh, it was interesting, at the um, Lindau meeting where I first gave a version of this talk, uh, Sheldon uh, Glashow, one of the Nobel laureates in physics, was there. I asked him if he went to Bronx High School of Science. I thought he had, and he had. And I asked him if he had Mr. Hellman for physics. Not me, my uncle. And he had. And uh, my uncle had had uh, three physics students that went on to win Nobel Prizes uh, in that discipline. I also had my uncle for physics, but that's another story. So, on Monday, we heard Nobel laureate Edvard Moser's Lindau Lecture, which is part of the Lindau-Heidelberg Partnership. And I was honored to give this year's corresponding Heidelberg Lecture there. Um, and this talk is based on the one that I gave there. Uh, first, a caveat and a note. The caveat, I'm an American, and so I naturally talk primarily from an American perspective. But the ideas the, uh, uh, that, I, that I will express are easily translatable into citizen, for citizens of other nations. And I will touch on that briefly later. Uh, second to note, uh, a paper with more details, it's the write-up of my Lindau lecture, is available um, on the Lindau uh, website, as is the video of that, which is very similar to this. And so if you like this and you want to share it with other people, I don't think this is uh, going to be online. That one is. And also um, a, a PDF of that paper and a couple of things I'll mention, Rethinking National Security, a report I put out in the spring and a book my wife and I wrote. PDFs are freely available. You don't have to buy any of these. And they are on my Stanford Publications page, which is easily found by Googling, or I guess I should be, say any search engine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, Stanford Hellman Publications, it's the first hit, and there are links, they're all at the bottom of that page. So, the Manhattan Project, which made the first nuclear weapons, transformed what had been a purely moral concern, ethical decision-making, into one that is essential for civilization to survive, so it became of the utmost practicality. And that was because, for the first time, it created the real possibility of humanity destroying itself. That's why this talk is titled, The Technological Imperative, The Technological Requirement for Ethical Evolution. And I realize that is a little dry. My wife might even say a boring title when she wants to get my attention. She says, that's boring. <laughs> and so I'll tell you that I was tempted to subtitle the talk, How I Screwed Up, and how to avoid doing the same. And it relates to one of the things that Bob talked about with Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which I won't have time to go into here, but that's covered in our book. Um, my talk related to the theme of the Lindau meeting, uh, which was advancing our understanding of physics, and it relates to HLF's theme as well, uh, expanding our knowledge of computer science and mathematics, because those understandings will come to an abrupt halt and in fact would likely be erased if there were a nuclear war. And of course, it's not just nuclear war. That risk to physics, math, computer science, and civilization in general is increased by advances taking place in cyber technology, 
artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, and other areas, as well as the potential for a catastrophic environmental crisis, such as extreme climate change, which was covered as the hot topic this year at HLF. All of those threats make it imperative, to use the word from the title of this talk, that we society accelerate its ethical evolution. And most of this talk consists of eight lessons that I learned, usually the hard way, meaning I screwed up, and that I hope will accelerate your process. So let's see. Lesson number one, it's really easy to fool ourselves. And of course, to make it more personal, the story is going to be how I fooled myself. In March 1975, the, what was then called the National Bureau of Standards in America, now it's NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, proposed a data encryption standard, or DES. Now, the prize that Witt and I won, the Turing Award, was for public key cryptography. This precedes it. This is conventional cryptography. But I should emphasize that public key cryptography becomes much more useful if there's a good conventional system, because public key cryptography is slow, and we typically use it only to exchange a key that's then used in a conventional system like DES. Well, DES seemed to have a 64-bit key size, which is a kind of natural key size for computer science, except one of the things Witt and I noticed was that almost immediately the algorithm threw away 8 bits leaving only a 56-bit key. That meant that there are 100,000 million million keys to an order of magnitude. I've rounded here. And we estimated that even with 1975's technology, you could build a special purpose LSI chip that would search a million keys per second. And of course, if you're building a special purpose chip, you don't just build one of them. The design cost is so high, you buy a million. You're now searching how many keys per second? A million, million keys per second. So how long does it take to search 100,000 million, million keys? 100,000 seconds, which is a little more than a day. And we estimated the cost would be 10,000 US dollars per solution. And even if we were wrong, even if we were off by an order of magnitude in our estimate, Moore's law was advancing so rapidly over that period of time and up until recently that even an order of magnitude error in our estimates, we didn't think we were anywhere near that far off, would be erased by the passage of five years' time. Well, we thought that, Witt and I thought this was a bug. No, actually, this is correct. I just want, I'm, not, I'm actually not using any slides, and so I'm just putting up the title so that you don't pay too much attention to them, so that I can have more eye contact with the audience. So Witt and I thought this was a bug, and we wrote letters to the Bureau of Standards, and they wrote back very nicely, and they didn't really answer our objections. And after a, an iteration of about three series of letters, and we were getting increasingly concerned, we realized the bug was a feature. Not from our point of view, but from the American NSA, National Security Agency's point of view. They did not want a publicly available cryptographic system that they could not break. And 56 bits was big enough that most people couldn't break it, but they could. So after six months of writing letters, we prepared to go public because we realized we had a, a technical uh, we had, I'm sorry, we had a political problem, not a technical problem. And if we were going to get change, we had to go to Congress, get hearings, we had to go to the media and get coverage. And as we're getting ready, two high-level NSA, NSA employees fly out to California, especially to meet with us, and they tell us in that meeting that I'm sure you remember at Paul Barron's offices uh, at the Cable Data, I'm talking to Witt right now, um, they told us, if you keep talking this way, you're going to really hurt national security. I think their exact words were grave harm to American national security. So I'm sure Witt went home, and, but um, I can just tell the story from my perspective. I went home to figure out the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do. And as I'm trying to figure it out, my intellect is telling me go public. NSA is telling me I'm going to hurt national security. But remember, this is 19th, January 76, not that much after Watergate. And so 
uh, we were somewhat skeptical of the government's position. But as I'm trying to figure out the right thing to do, an idea just pops into my head, coming out of nowhere. Well, it came from the deep unconscious. Forget about what's right and wrong. You'll never have more of an opportunity to become famous. Run with it! Now, who would want to jeopardize national security, cause grave harm potentially to national security, just to be famous? Well, the answer is a lot of us, but we don't like to admit it. I call this a shadow motivation. It's something that usually is so abhorrent to our conscious minds that we keep it at an unconscious level. In my case, I was lucky that it actually bubbled up to consciousness, but, uh, and I liken it to a movie where, you know, there's a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the actor's other shoulder, so the devil's whispering in my ear, run with it. And at the time, I thought I really brushed him off my shoulder quite vigorously, but all I really did was push him into my unconscious where he could work his mischief uh, unseen. And we did go public with it. By the way, going public was the right decision. Uh, Admiral Inman, who was the director of NSA in a, uh, an interview about five, six years ago, uh, basically said that. Uh, he's re-evaluated. But I was lucky that I made the right decision since I was making it unethically. I mean, I, 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 had, I was not really trying to do the right thing. What I realized is I had come up with what I wanted to do and then come up with the justification for doing it, whether it was right or wrong. And how did I realize that? Well, five years later, remember this was January 76 that the devil's on my shoulder. In the summer of 81, Dorothy and I are trying to sort out our marriage, which at that point was in deep trouble. The good news is it isn't anymore. Uh, we're madly in love again. Uh, we thank each other daily. But at that point, we were working it out, and I finally had gotten to the point that I would take a week. I would not have done this a year earlier. Uh, a week to really look at the bigger issues of life. And as part of that week-long uh, retreat, we saw a documentary called Day After Trinity. Trinity is the co was the code name for the first test of an atomic weapon in the New Mexico desert in, at Alamogordo, New Mexico in July 1945. This is the day after Trinity. And in that documentary, each of the about five or six Manhattan Project scientists is asked, so what was your motivation for working on this horrible weapon of mass destruction that killed at least 100,000, and no one knows for sure, probably 200,000, probably more, men, women, and children indiscriminately? And each of the scientists gets excited. Their, you, their faces light up. It's like they're going to Los Alamos as young men, and they all were men. Uh, and they said, Hitler. Fission had been discovered, nuclear fission had been discovered in Germany in 38, I think, uh, Han. And if Hitler got the bomb before we did, it would be the end of civilization as we know it. It would be a thousand years of dark ages. Later in the documentary, the interviewer comes back to each of the um, scientists and says, well, when Hitler was defeated, why did you keep working just as hard, maybe harder? And their faces fall. They don't know why they kept working. And that is what helped me realize that I'd fooled myself. I believe that the scientists fooled themselves. They had socially acceptable reasons which they brought to consciousness, but they also had socially unacceptable reasons that they would not bring to consciousness. I can't be sure with them that that even happened or what they were, but if I were one of them, it might have been, is my brain powerful enough to destroy a city? We identify with our minds. But you'd have to do the experiment. You're a scientist. You can't just do the calculations. I mean, this is horrible. I mean, killing over 100,000 men, women, and children to prove that your brain is that powerful. Another, I have to admit, I didn't play football as a kid. I was kind of the geek uh, some of you might identify. And is this my chance for the girls to fall at my feet instead of that stupid football quarterback? Again, who would want to kill tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people just for that? And yet, unless you're really careful, it's easy to fool yourself. Oh, Robert Wilson, one of the scientists who uh, interviewed in the documentary, who uh, became the first director of Fermilab, when he's asked about this, he even said, in terms of everything that I believed in, 
before, during, and after the war, I cannot understand why I did not walk away from Los Alamos, the laboratory where they developed the weapon. But it simply was not in the air. Our life was directed to do one thing, and we as automatons were doing it. So I realized what I had done five years earlier when I thought I brushed the devil off my shoulder, I just pushed him down, and I vowed I would never make that mistake again. I'd made the right decision for the wrong reasons. It could have been the wrong decision for the wrong reasons. So, what's lesson number two? It's the value of outside help. Roughly five years after I vowed that I would never fool myself again, I'm confronted with another major ethical decision. So, Many of you know that Whit Diffie and Ralph Merkel and I invented public key cryptography. We published separately. There are differences uh, in, in, in our work, but um, we basically are all equal, equally uh, responsible for inventing public key cryptography in my mind. Uh, Ravesh Shamir and Adelman, RSA that you probably heard of, at MIT, building on our work, developed the RSA algorithm that did what Witt and I had proposed in our paper, not what Ralph had proposed in his, better than we had been able to do. In their paper, they credit Witt and me, because they didn't know about Ralph, unfortunately he doesn't get as much credit as he deserves, with inventing public key cryptography. And so when, it, when they started a company, I went to Ron Rivest and said, hey, how about paying us royalties? Well, RSA and Jim Bidzos, who is the president of RSA, said, your patents are invalid, sue us. The bottom line is they sold their company for uh, $250 million, and our patents made almost nothing. There were other reasons, but I was really not happy with Ravest, Shamir, Adelman, and Bidzos. By the way, we're good friends now, which is a whole other story, and it's going to relate to the next lesson. Friends are better than enemies, but I'll come to that in a minute. So what happens is uh, Lou Morris had started a company called Silink with Jim Omura, who some of you know from communication theory. And Lou comes to me and says, you help me get an exclusive license to Stanford's patents, and forgive the language, this is how he spoke, and we'll get those RSA bastards by the balls. And I had vowed five years earlier not to do things for the wrong reasons. If I, was doing, if I was accepting his offer and helping him out of revenge, that would be unethical. If I was doing it because it was a way to make money off something that wasn't make money, that was okay. But I was so emotionally involved, I was so angry at that time, I'm not anymore with RSA, and in fact, I can see how they see it as all my fault, possibly. I don't know for sure. I mean, that's how arguments often work. I know that from my marriage. Um, so I went to Dorothy and I said, I can't be sure I'm not fooling myself again. And she was not as emotionally involved in it. She said, oh, it's easy. Go to Niels Reimers, who was the director of technology licensing at Stanford. He has the same business interest that you do. He does not have the same emotional involvement. Let him make the decision. I went to Niels and he said, of course we go with Lou Morris's offer. It's the only way we have a chance to make money. It's the same decision I would have made on my own, but this way I can be certain that I didn't fool myself. So that's lesson two, the value of outside help. Lesson number three, friends are better than enemies. Well, I've already mentioned that, and everyone would say, of course friends are better than enemies. But the real question is, how many people do the hard work, take the risk to try to turn an enemy into a friend. And in the write-up of my uh, Lindau talk, I have two examples, but I'll only have time for one here. In 1978, so two years after we went public with uh, the DES controversy, I get a call from the director's office at NSA. Admiral Inman, the director of NSA, will be in California. Would I be willing to meet with him? Well. Up to this point, we've been fighting NSA, but never directly. There's a joke that NSA does not stand for National Security Agency. It stands for never say anything or no such agency. And so Inman was an out-of-the-box thinker. He still is, and he's a good friend now, uh, although at this point he was still an enemy. Uh, and he comes, I say, I'd be happy to meet with him. He comes to my office at Stanford a couple of weeks later, 
And the first thing he does is he looks over at me and he says, smiling, it's nice to see that you don't have horns. That's how I was being depicted within NSA. I was the devil incarnate. Well, I looked back at him, smiled, and said, same here, because I'd been demonizing them as well. And that was a cautious initial meeting. But out of that cautious initial meeting and talking, and his taking the risk to try to turn an enemy into a friend, we developed actually a good friendship, a close friendship. And as one example that friends are better than enemies, I did not become friends with him so he would sign statements of support for like rethinking national security, which I'll talk about in a minute, a few minutes. But he has signed a statement of support for the need to fundamentally rethink American national security. What we're doing is not working. And having a former director of NSA sign that statement was very, very helpful. By the way, I used friends are better than enemies in a previous HLF talk. It was a different talk, but at the Friday night um, uh, fare, uh, uh, farewell dinner, one of the young researchers, when she was asked what she'd learned at HLF, she said, I learned that friends are better than enemies. I need my glasses again. Okay, lesson number four. Get practice by correcting even minor ethical lapses. So remember, I fooled myself in 1976 when I thought I brushed the devil off my shoulder, but I only pushed him into my unconscious. Whereas in 10 years later, roughly 1986, when Lou Morris came to me, uh, I realized I might be fooling myself, and I got help from Dorothy uh, and Niels Reimers to make sure I wasn't fooling myself. What had happened that allowed me to recognize the difference? Well, remember, in the midpoint, in that summer of 1981, when I saw Day After Trinity, Dorothy and I had committed to make our marriage work. And as part of that, we each committed to really fulfill our wedding vows in which we said, I will love you through good times and bad. I thought I was doing that, and yet when things got tough, I would yell at her. She would never yell at me, of course. Very, I mean, we had our issues. <laughs> And so both of us were breaking our marriage vows by mistreating one another in the hard times. And so what had happened is I had, it's kind of like weightlifting. If you want to win a weightlifting contest, and let's see, is it Bob, who, who is it? No, it's uh, David Patterson that's a weightlifter. Uh, he doesn't just go to a weightlift, uh, Turing Award winner. He doesn't just go and try to lift weights at a contest. He's working out all the time. In the same way, if I waited for the major ethical decisions like going public about DES or accepting Lou Morris's offer, those come along once every 10 years, if that, and you're out of practice. But I had had daily practice, fortunately or unfortunately, because I tended to mistreat Dorothy much too often at that point in time. And so by lowering the bar and regarding even minor ethical lapses as unacceptable, I had built up the understanding and the recognition. The other thing, by the way, my life got better. Uh, yelling at Dorothy never got what I wanted, and yet I kept trying it time and time again. I do not do that anymore, thank God. Lesson number five, ethics is an evolutionary process. We tend to think of ethical decision-making as static, and yet, if you really think about it just a little bit, you'll see that it changes dynamically over time. It evolves. Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were, supreme, were highly ethical by the standards of their day, and yet today, each of them would be in jail for owning human beings. To take a more personal situation, Alan Turing, for whom our award is named, was hounded to death in the 1950s by the British legal system that was enforcing the ethical standards. So remember, these were the ethical standards of the 50s. Homosexuality was a crime deserving of punishment in jail, or in his case, chemical castration. And he, it's the strong evidence he committed suicide, that was the result of the inquest. It's easy to see unethical behavior in the past. It's much harder to see it in the present. So how can we do that? I would argue that it's, we need to apply the scientific spirit. And the definition of the scientific spirit that I really like was given to me by a man named Harry Rathbun. He died in the 1980s, and he was in his own 90s. He was born in the 1890s. 
Uh, Harry was a uh, well, well-known and beloved uh, professor at Stanford um, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s. And Harry defined, he was an electrical engineer by training as an undergraduate and then became an attorney and taught business law. He defined the scientific spirit as a zealous search for the truth with a ruthless disregard for commonly held beliefs when contradicted by observations. And he used to smile when the word zealous and ruthless came up. But if you think about it, that's how we do things. And let's see. So what might we investigate if we undertook any search for the truth, much less a zealous search for the truth, going beyond the usual boundaries of science and applying it to our foreign policy and our military policy? Again, as an American, um, well, actually, as any person, you might ask, how ethical is society's current approach to nuclear weapons? Is it ethical to threaten to destroy civilization in an effort to preserve the peace? And then, is it ethical to use that threat over much more minor um, issues than just the survival of our nation, as we've done? Like the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was nothing really essential at stake there for the United States. I don't have time to go into that. Which recent wars have been ethical? Or, to be more practical, which recent wars of the United States have had their intended result? Which have backfired? All of them. And by the way, just to make sure to point out that I'm not anti-American, the French and the British have made similar mistakes. And I was, oh, I was talking with somebody from Algeria about. It. There's lots of examples, and you can point to even small nations making mistakes. Are ethics being adequately factored into the development of artificial intelligence? Well, this was the topic in uh, Jasmine Jahan's uh, Monday workshop on ethics and AI. How ethical is society's current response to climate change? The hot topic session really went into this. There are uncertainties, but are the uncertainties that great? And is the tale of the uncertainty such that it goes into catastrophe with enough probability that we should be doing much more than we're now doing? Okay, let me move from lesson five, that ethics is an evolutionary process, to lesson six. And all of these are in the written paper, so you don't have to take notes. The technological advances require accelerating our ethical evolution. Science and engineering, well, let me back up. You might say the problem is nuclear weapons. You might say another problem is climate change. Another problem is uh, cyber weapons being developed, uh, artificial intelligence, killer robots. But I really see all of these as having a common root cause of which they are symptoms. And we need to deal with that root cause. The root problem, as I see it, is that technology has given human beings physical power that historically was thought of as godlike in nature. To use the Judeo-Christian uh, heritage as an example, in the Bible, only God had the ability to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with thunderbolts. What do we call them today? Nuclear weapons. In the Bible, only God was able to create a flood that would necessitate Noah building an ark. Climate change threatens similar consequences today. And in Genesis, only God could create life forms. We do it routinely in laboratories. So in contrast to the godlike physical power that technology has given us, our Maturity level as a species will never be godlike, but it has to go beyond terrible twos where we throw tantrums. And at best, I'd say as a society, we behave as irresponsible adolescents who are having a great party and anyone who says, hey, maybe we should stop drinking because there's going to be a hangover in the morning, people call him a party pooper. And so I sometimes liken humanity to a 16-year-old kid with a new driver's license and not a very responsible 16-year-old kid, an irresponsible one, who gets his hands on a 500-horsepower Ferrari. And he is either, we are either going to grow up really fast or we're going to destroy ourselves. And so the there's a positive to that negative. We, it, it's a goad to accelerating our ethical evolution, which is lesson number six. Technological advances are requiring that. Um, society behaves as if these various threats are tolerable, so it pays to look at nuclear war because 
It's not the only one, but it's the most, it's underappreciated. In the 80s, people were really concerned. But today, in fact, in the opening ceremony, climate change was put forth as the greatest existential threat to humanity. I think that's wrong. I think it is a major threat to humanity, but nuclear weapons are the only thing that could wipe us out as I'm talking. And so we need to work on both. So let me look at nuclear weapons. How great is the risk? Well, we're all mathematicians, computer scientists. We're comfortable with order of magnitude estimates. That's all we need here. To an order of magnitude, how many years do you think society can go on its current path with threatening to destroy civilization with nuclear weapons in an effort to preserve the peace before that strategy known as nuclear deterrence fails and we actually have an accident and destroy civilization? Almost everyone I've asked sees 10 years as too short a, an expected time horizon. It could happen in 10 years. The risk may be far too great over 10 years, but it's not likely to happen in 10 years. I jump over 100 to 1,000 years, and almost everyone I've asked, there are some minor exceptions, sees 1,000 years as wildly optimistic. We'll probably have between 10 and 20 crises comparable to the Cuban Missile Crisis in that time. If we look at Georgian wars and Ukrainian wars, which happened in 2008 and 2014, six years apart, maybe every 10 years, so we'd have 100 of those. Uh, and there are a lot of other things you don't know about. So that is to explain why most people see 1,000 years as wildly optimistic. Well, the only order of magnitude left between 10 years and 1,000 years is 100 years, which first sounds OK, because we won't be around in 100 years, and neither will anyone else in the audience with high probability. But if the time horizon is 100 years, that's equivalent to roughly 1% per year risk, 10% per decade. How many of you in the audience are in your 20s? Yeah. You've got probably 60, 70 years left in your life expectancy. 1% a year is not good. And so um, this is uh, showing that the risk is far greater than society gives it credit for. Oh, so now, order of magnitude works fine for this audience. But for everyone else, and actually even for this audience, I like this drawing that I had made up. Imagine a man, it's a way to see the risk another way. Imagine a man wearing a TNT vest were to walk in that back door and sit down right here between the two of you. Would you stay there? Even, you would get out of here and everyone would get out of this room as fast as they could. Even if you knew he was not a suicide bomber, he did not have the button for setting off his suicide vest, I mean the TNT vest. There was, he said, there's one button in Washington with President Trump, a very cautious man. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. And the other button is in Moscow with President Putin. Again, very cautious. Nothing to worry about. We'd still get out of here. And even, especially when we remembered that there were additional buttons in London and Paris and Beijing, and there's a small button in Pyongyang, the North Korean capital, and the terrorists are trying to get one of their own. So why, just because we cannot see the weapons controlled by those buttons, have we sat here for 50, 60 years complacently assuming that just because the Earth's explosive vest has not yet gone off, it never will? Okay, back to not using slides. Lesson number seven. There is great hope of humanity becoming more ethical. This is, in some sense, the most important lesson, because the people I've talked to here and at Lindau, one of the big arguments that comes up is, you can't change human nature, basically. They put it in different ways. But there's actually great hope of changing, um, of humanity becoming ethical enough to survive. I'm convinced there's hope. Now, most fundamentally, my hope comes from the transformation I have made personally. Forty years ago, Dorothy was ready to leave me. Life, living with me was that impossible. That was roughly uh, 12 years into our marriage. And with her dragging me, kicking and screaming through a process that I now greatly appreciate, we haven't had a single fight in well over 15, probably closer to 20 years. I did not, I grew up in the New York Jewish culture. Things like that don't happen. And so, um, that is fundamentally why I have hope, and um, 
But And so really, the, the greatest hope is what happens at a personal level. And I think we've all seen changes of that kind in our lives and could have even more. I mean, it's not like we stopped evolving uh, 15 or 20 years ago when we stopped fighting. We keep learning new things, and each of you keeps learning new things. A friend of ours who read our book put it very nicely after several months of really, you know, digesting the ideas, talking with us. She said, oh, I finally get it. World peace begins at home. And it really does. How we treat others is how we treat other nations. Um, let's see. Well, since this will, should not be a major theme at a conference on math and computer science, I'll refer those interested in more personal details to our book. And I'll tell you that Dorothy kept asking me as we wrote it several years ago, do we have to tell them that? And I said, we don't have to, it's up to you. But she eventually agreed, and everything that we discussed went into the book. So it's very transparent. We don't say, we, got, we fell in love, and we just went from there. We fell in love, we ruined it, and then we built it back up. A second reason for hope that I have may seem paradoxical at first. Many people see what we're trying to do as a fool's errand. And yet, let me ask the laureates among you, how many of you were encouraged in the work that led to your prize? How many people said, great work, Bob, do that? Actually, let me ask you, and I forget the answer, I probably asked you this. Did people encourage you or discourage you at first? In between. Oh, Vin, you got encouragement, but also people, you, I, I, I emailed you about this. People thought, you said, people thought packet switching was, would not work for voice and uh, video. It might be useful for email. And, but today we have video over uh, IP. And when I was at the Lindau meeting, I asked five of the Nobel laureates before my talk there, how many of them had been encouraged, and four out of the five had been discouraged. One of them, Danny Sheckman, told me that Linus Pauling called his work on quasi-crystals, for which he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, quasi-science. So the best work often, maybe even usually, appears foolish a priori. Brad Parkinson, GPS, had that, uh, and I don't have time to go into that. The third reason for hope is we need to accelerate the process, not start it. If we had to start the process of ethical evolution, it would be hard. But it's already underway. We just need to accelerate it. Many parts of the world have abolished slavery, established universal suffrage, improved human rights, and even started to tackle environmental degradation. We've had some steps backward lately, but overall, we're moving forward. The world's nuclear arsenal, to take that example, has fallen by 80% since 1986, when there were 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Now, today, there are about 14,000, which is still far too many, more than are needed for nuclear deterrence. But still, an 80% reduction is very, very hopeful. Lesson number eight, everyone can play a role. Many of you are already working to solve one or more of the existential problems we face. The Hot Topic session had people working on climate change. And I was honored to give the first version of this talk at the same series of Lindau meetings that gave rise to the Minow Declaration of 1955 on nuclear weapons and war, as well as a second Minow Declaration of 2015 on climate change. And at Lindau, I noted that in many ways, the talk I was giving there and the talk that I'm uh, doing in slightly modified form here today could be viewed as seconding those two Minow Declarations. And I encourage you to read them. If you go to Wikipedia and look up uh, Minow Declaration, the text of both of them is there. But even when one is a Nobel laureate, even when one is a Heidelberg laureate, I suspect that the attitude or the question arises, how can I, a single individual, make a difference on such a big problem? And I know that they think that way because I've asked them, but also I have a friend who's an American congressman, even more powerful than a Nobel laureate on these issues. And what he said to me is, I'm one of 435 in the House of Representatives. Even if I start to talk this way, I've got to convince a majority. Even if we get the House on board, we have to get the Senate. 
and then we've got to get the president, and then we have to worry that the public isn't going to kick us out of office because what we really need to do appears crazy in the old paradigm. And so, none one of us can solve this problem by ourselves, but if enough of us work at moving things a little bit all together, we can move it a lot. And I'll just give you one example. It's actually the, most, the best example. It occurred recently. A friend of mine who works on rethinking national security with me was at a dinner about four months ago on a totally different subject. The man sitting next to him says, so what do you do? And he says, well, I work with Marty Hellman on rethinking national security. And he gave the elevator pitch, the 32nd pitch. In 1945, the US was totally secure. Trillions of dollars later today, we can be destroyed in under an hour. What went wrong? Like, he didn't say it, but in math, we call that a reductio ad absurdum, and it's a proof that at least one assumption is off, and the most fundamental assumption here, which is covered in the statement that Admiral Inman signed, is, uh, asked, is asked as a question. Is it possible that in an age of nuclear weapons, uh, cyber attacks, terrorism, and global environmental crises, is it possible that national security is becoming obsolete as a concept unless we think of it as a piece of global security, including that of our adversaries? You see why my congressman friend has to worry about being voted out of office if he said that. So, the, his table, my friend's table mate was intrigued. He'd never thought of it that way before. <clears throat> And he said, I want to help you. And he works in a way that could help us. But as the three of us now are talking, my friend, his table mate, and me, he says, yeah, by the way, I have a friend who's a congressman. You ought to talk to him. I look him up online, and it turns out that he's a very influential congressman. Uh, I won't go into details. But he's now working with us. And if things pan out as planned, something really good could come from it. Now, it might fail. Everything else like this that I've thought of, except for one thing, uh, didn't have a major impact, but one did have a major impact. And so we keep trying. And the key thing here is my friend who went to that dinner, all he did was talk. Talking is much more effective than people realize. It's the way we create societal interest, societal concern, and societal motivation to solve these problems. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'll finish up. What if you're a citizen of a non-nuclear nation, as many of the young researchers are? Well, it turns out the non-nuclear nations might play the leading role because you are less invested in the myth of the power of these weapons. And one piece of evidence, ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize and it was, let's see, what does it say here? For its groundbreaking efforts to achieve a treaty-based prohibition of such weapons. None of the nuclear states voted in favor of that treaty at the UN. It was carried by the non-nuclear nations. But even those nations that take this issue with some seriousness do still, not, still do not treat it with the respect it deserves. They don't treat it as the existential threat that it actually is. If they did, that would be a game changer. So, in conclusion, I've talked mostly about evolving our thinking about nuclear weapons because that's the greatest immediate threat. It's the one I've studied the most. But many of the ideas carry over to climate change and other risks caused by our godlike technological power. All eight lessons for ethical evolution also apply to interpersonal relationships. And that's where I first got started, where I still see the most immediate benefits and where I encourage you to try it because you will also see immediate benefits uh, applying it there. I appreciate what many of you are already doing to build a better world, a safer world, and a more ethical world, whether it's with, with respect to nuclear weapons, climate change, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, or just building a more loving home or har a more harmonious workplace. I'll close with a lesson that I learned from Harry Rathbun, that mentor who I mentioned before. He said there are two hypotheses. The nobler hypothesis, the better hypothesis, is that human beings are capable of the radical changes needed for survival in this age of nuclear weapons and other uh, technological power. The less noble hypothesis is that we're doomed. If we accept the less noble hypothesis, we're doomed even if we were capable of the change. If we accept the nobler hypothesis, the worst that happens is we go down fighting. And the best that happens is we succeed. So why not assume the noble hypothesis? Thank you.
I think we have time for a few questions. So uh, we have some roving microphones. Anyone care to uh, make a comment or ask a question? Don't be shy. Vint has one over there. Microphone. What, bring your microphone, Bob. Please, thank you. I suppose I should go back. Uh, it's Vince Cerf again. First of all, that's a fantastic talk, and that leads to my question. Was this, was this video recorded, and will it be available? Do we know? Um, because uh, well, I hope it, so. If it isn't, the Lindau talk was about 80, 90 percent the same. It was, and that, although that, this one, I went to that one too, yes, as you know, a, and, and this one was even better. Oh. So, uh, so uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, now, I also note that, uh, that we were um, captioning, live captioning, and if, if we can keep the text of that, that would be a wonderful backup. But in any case, it's not a question at all, Marty. It was just a terrific well, I, talk. Thank he, you for doing I it. I paid him for this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank if I've learned some of your lessons, that's good payment. Well, th thank you, Vint. That means a lot to me. Thank you very much. My partner in crime. I, I'm just curious, you referred to the fact that after Germany surrendered, people at Los Alamos continued working on nuclear weapons. One person didn't, Joseph Rothblatt. Rot Rothblatt. And he was, he was threatened with being prosecuted if he talked to the other people about it. So okay. there are pressures you're not reflecting yes. here. And also, by the way, I'm not judging the people who continued working on the Manhattan Project. It was wartime. Thousands of people were dying daily. Uh, I mean, we cannot judge them by the standards of today. But jo Joseph Rothblatt won the Nobel Peace Prize with pugwash uh, for his efforts. Uh, and, and I think that was part of it. Thank you for pointing that out, Whit. There's some in the back. There's one over here, and there's something in the back, too, if, if that helps you, Bob. Or just come to the microphones is the yeah, other thing. Come to the microphones. Yeah, in the meantime, why don't, there's one over here that you could get, I think. Unless, ah, the young woman, the young researcher's there, please. Uh, yes, thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, you seem to, like, in, in your work on especially cryptography, there, there are obvious ethical and political implications of this. But for, for many of the young researchers here, especially very mathematical work often doesn't seem explicitly political. What would you say about, like, do, yes, does, okay. do we still have, like, a moral, ethical... Well, first of all, you still have personal relationships. You still are voters in your nation. So, yes, you have an ethical uh, imperative. Uh, it may not apply to your work, but it may apply to your work more than you think. Uh, in my graduate work, I studied probability theory, statistics. I learned a little number theory from error correcting codes and information theory. But when I had to learn number theory for cryptography, uh, I, I found one of the papers or books I read said number theory is the purest of pure mathematics with absolutely no practical applications. Not true. So you never know. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, my question relates to sort of more complicated ethical decisions. So the examples that you brought up, like working at Los Alamos, um, in hindsight, this, the solution to this problem is sort of simpler. However, um, in our very complicated world, um, sometimes it's almost impossible to stay away completely from unethical behaviors. For example, if your lovely physics department is partially funded by the defense industry, mm. what would you, do you have any comments about yes, that? Yes, well, well, for a more, a, a, better, a, a, a more direct example might be uh, the attack on Libya. Gaddafi was going to kill thousands of rebels, and so we attacked Libya, the West, and yet more Libyans have died as a result of that than if we'd left Gaddafi in power. So sometimes it's the lesser of two evils. And one of the things that I try to apply there is, do I have blood on my hands? I mean, if things are happening and I haven't played a role in it, um, I'm not as responsible. Of course, you have, then you have the question of responsibility for protect, to protect, which was used in Libya. Um, I've accepted in the past um, uh, Defense Department uh, funding. And it actually, some of it has had positive effects. We live in, an, uh, in a world that is so profoundly 
unethical by the standards of 50 or 100 years from now that it's impossible to live a purely ethical life. And I think it's good to recognize that and that there will be trade-offs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You spoke very vividly about a personal decision-making, but if we take an example like autonomous vehicles, these systems are developed over many years by many people with many different uh, patents and other things there. What kind of legal structure do we need when things go wrong in order to adjudicate who's responsible for such action? Uh, I wish I had answers to all these questions. Uh, and for, that's one where people with other expertise will have to figure in. But I'd say that one thing we can do, as uh, especially the laureates um, among us who have credibility with our governments, uh, would be to bring these issues up and to, uh, to get them working on it. It's not that we'll come up with the answer right away, but to, that it should, be, it should not just be brushed aside. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I'm really grateful for the magnificent talk. Thank you very much. I have a question regarding the nuclear issue that you mentioned. I'm wondering whether it's not like we're fighting the, the Nash equilibrium, like in the prisoner's dilemma. I mean, I think most of us would agree that, we, that the world would be better off if we didn't have the uh, nuclear weapons, but the, the problem is that each one of us might be kind of uh, like scared that the other country is gonna, gonna have this weapon and that what leads to this situation that we have, that we are like arming up, the countries are arming up, uh, like in the prisoners. Yes. Thank so, you. I've often said that if I had a magic wand and could make all the nuclear weapons in the world disappear in an instant, but nothing else changed, I'm not sure I would waive it because we might even be in a more dangerous situation. We might believe we could fight wars without nuclear weapons getting involved and yet the knowledge of how to build them will always be there. It's going to be a process by which these weapons uh, are reduced and probably ultimately eliminated, but they will not be eliminated in the world as it exists today. We'll have to build a much more reasonable world, a much more mature society and species before that happens. But that's the good news. It's not just a negative. We have to build a better world, one that we can be proud to pass on to our children, our grandchildren, your children, grandchildren. Uh, and that's what drives me much more than the threat. Thank you. Let's thank Marty again for his inspirational talk.